Shalom, and welcome to another edition of Our Daily Bread, where we discuss the weekly Torah portion. I'm Messianic Torah, and uh, this year's parasha is the, uh, we're right now in the eighth parasha of the book of Bereshit, also called Genesis, and it's called Vayashlach, which means, and he sent. This week's parasha starts in Genesis 32, verse 4, and goes through 36, verse 43, with the half Torah being in Hosea, or Hoshea, 12, verses 12 through 14, verse 10. And my message this year for 2013-14 is called Preparing for Judgment. And uh, in this week's parasha, uh, what we have, uh, of course, we go right into the story of of what some call Yaakov's trouble. This is the time when he's going to return and deal with his brother Asaph, and and we're going to see you know all the the fear and 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 trouble that he's worried about is going to happen when they reunite. Since obviously Asaph or Esau um, wanted to kill him when he fled before. And and so we're going to go through that in the, in this week's uh, message, and and then you're going to get into the second half, which is um, about Dina uh, and the rape of Dina, daughter of Yisrael, by uh, Hamor uh, and Shechem. Uh, well, not by both of them, but uh, uh, by Shechem, and uh, his father was the king, uh, Hamor. And uh, then we're going to end up with uh, Rachel or Rachel giving birth to um, uh, Benjamin and uh, and then dying uh, in the birth process. And we get to the half Torah. Uh, so my message this year is called Preparing for Judgment. And one of the things that I, I like to do is look at the parashat, of course, you know, we look at it every year. Every year we come back to these stories. But it's really best to come back every year with a fresh set of eyes. Um, in a way, you can't help but coming with a fresh set of eyes because you've changed, you've learned, and you've grown. Uh, hopefully you've done some Torah study, which will uh, affect that uh, change. And, and what happens is you can't look at the scriptures the same way you looked at them before. A lot of people... When they start with the wrong mindset, which is to figure out what they are, almost as if they were just one dimensional. Um, it's very similar to the, to the New Testament where Mashiach, Messiah, comes and he teaches in parables. Now he's teaching stories that have biblical meaning. And if a person comes in and just says, well, I learned the story, like the parable of the wheat and the tares. Well, we learned about the wheat and the tares. That's all Messiah was teaching. Don't go trying to make up stuff that it was about the the kingdom and the children of God and the end of the world. And that's all speculation. That's that's just all stuff people uh, theologies that that people are imagining and making up and analogies. Well, you hear that kind of thing out there in in um, in the the religious world. There's people who very much don't like. Um, the uh, patterns or double meanings or alternate meanings or anything in depth or allegorical. Um, there's a lot of very straight laced people want to say, well, it just says this and that's all it really means. Don't try making it uh, out to mean anything else. Or if, if you think it means something else, that's not really as weighty as what, what it uh, specifically says in the literal. But that's just not true. And that wouldn't have that wouldn't have worked if you were dealing with the Messiah himself because the Messiah would have come teaching in parables and if you had that attitude coming into it you would miss all of the teachings that he brought and all all that great value because the relevance wasn't about the wheat and the tares and about agricultural life that's not why he came teaching that message and so if that's all you take away from it you missed everything and there's many people who studied the Bible that way there's many people who read these stories, even the parashahs, and they just see literally what happened, and to them, that's all it was. Didn't have any significance, no spiritual significance or meaning. It was just the story of, for the story's sake. And a lot of times, there's many layers and levels. <clears throat> there's interpretations that can be very loose patterns. 
um, that aren't maybe directly what was intended there, but it doesn't mean it doesn't line up with a pattern and still teach a lesson. And then there's ones, there's lessons that are that are very specifically embedded that I think that you'd be hard pressed to say that that wasn't the point of teaching that message. That wasn't the exact spiritual definition, just like Messiah did with the parables when he says the wheat's the children of God and the tares are the children of the devil. Well, he's giving us very specific secondary meanings that that parable uh, was meant to teach. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not deeper meanings in the relationship and the parable of the wheat and the tares that you could extrapolate out of that. Um, and that doesn't mean they're, they're necessarily true or they're necessarily wrong um, because it can be misapplied, but it can also be correctly applied in other unintended um, um, teachings and, and things like that. But then there's still the hardwired um, biblical truths that are embedded in these things for us to get. So it's important to understand this because I think every year that you come back to these things, it's easy to just go, oh, the story of Esau and Yaakov. You already know that. And then you'll miss everything. You'll miss the five extra layers of understanding that can teach you uh, application of these things that we learn by listening to this story and observing these people's lives. Um, people's lives are a parable. If you look at Messiah, his life taught millions upon millions of people for generations to come just by observing his life and taking lessons from both his words and the way he lived and you know the the stories about him have been you know profoundly important in altering people's choices which changes their life which changes the world and impacts you know on on a much things on a much larger scale so uh, all this stuff is relevant. So it's important to, as I call it, uh, f find the edges, to fill around the outside, to look at things, even more obscure things, um, for meaning. And and if, if, if they're not that relevant, then great, you can just ignore them. But sometimes in the search, you'll find things, how will you know that something wasn't really profound and, and changed the way you view things if you didn't search for it? And that's why I always go back to Torah study um, and Bible study, that uh, you know, there's way too big of a reliance on other people's opinions, and even historical opinions are just the easiest opinions that it's easy to accept them. See, a lot of people say the reason why a lot of people like the literal side of things is because you don't have to really think. You can go, well, the cat is brown. Great, the cat's brown. Don't have to think about that. It takes more effort to say. The cat is brown. What is God trying to communicate here? Is there something significant about the cat being brown? Or is it not significant? It's just part of the story. I don't know. Is there any other brown cats in the Bible that we should know about that might give us a clue to the importance of this? Or any other cats? Or any other brown things? I mean, what is it? What do these words mean? What else can they mean? How are they... Uh, what is the the structure of the ancient Hebrew pictographs? Are they going to reveal something uh, that's a deeper meaning here? I mean, there's tons of ways to go about the brown cat. and Or you can just say, oh, don't be silly. Just says it's a brown cat. I don't need to think about that. Well, that's not due diligence. You see, it's kind of like being in love. Okay? There's the surface relationships we all have with people. But when you're in love, and, that, and that's different than loving someone, you can love somebody and not be in love with them. You can be really when you, and I don't necessarily think that that's just the feeling of love, like infatuation, like Hollywood is portrayed. Uh, I don't put a lot of value in that. But when you're talking about being in love versus having love for, that's an active thing, that in love. It's like, it's like you're swimming. It's a depth. You can't, you can't get enough of that person. You want to engage more. You, you are, no matter how close you are, it's not close enough. And, and it's the same way with the Torah. Um, with the Torah, there's, okay, yeah, you know, people can say, oh yeah, the Bible, I, I love that, yeah. But then there's those who just can't get enough, who want to sit at the master's feet, who want to, to squeeze and savor every bite 
of that bread of life who want to to analyze it and contemplate it. And just like it said about King David, King David is, you know, he meditated on the the law, the Torah, day and night. Right? It was his delight. It wasn't his burden. It was something that he because he had this this love for it. And what was what does his name mean? Dawid is my beloved, right? So you see this relationship of, of love and and of meditation, which is just to focus on something, to focus on something, and to get closer and closer and think about it and go deeper inside and, and deeper outside. And you know, that's something that everybody has to contemplate because religion has trained people the opposite. They've a bunch of religious flabby people out there, right? They're not in shape. Because why? Uh, because they've been taught, sit in the pew, okay? Listen to the pastor. Let somebody else dig down in the earth and find the treasures and just bring them up and show them to you. But do you know what? The person who dug for that treasure has a greater appreciation when they finally found it because they put all that work and scraped all that dirt away, and by the sweat uh, of their brow, they dug through there and found those glorious breakthrough moments where they find those treasures. Nobody appreciates it like them. It's the same reason why nobody's going to love that baby like its mother, just naturally, because the mother labored for that that baby. The mother went through the pain and and, and the nine months of caring that baby and went through everything in order to get up to this one point and suffered and lost sleep and was nauseous and and was uncomfortable and couldn't walk and did this long before the baby was ever born and cared for the baby and took care of herself and tried to you know eat good and did all these things working for something that she had not yet seen okay and pain in advance with no knowing of what it was going to be, what, that the reward was even going to be there. You see, and this is this is so difficult of a situation to go through. Just like a a, a woman who loses a child, you know, whether it's a miscarriage or, or, or stillbirth, um, or or even a living child. But I think it's even tougher in 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 some ways. Well, it's just different. It's not necessarily tougher or, or not tougher but it there's a there's a different type of loss when when it's a, a miscarriage or something like that because of the fact that what you have is you've only put in the work you've only suffered for that baby but you didn't even get the moment of right when it's all worth it when you see that little living creature looking back at you and you get that that feeling that this wasn't for nothing Right? It's the unseen while the baby's in the womb. And then when the baby comes out and you see that baby face to face and, and they take that baby and they put it in, in the mother's arms who just went through so much pain and so much struggle, not even including all the pain and stuff that she went through up to this point, when that baby is put in her arms and, and its head just goes right on her skin, and she looks in the eyes of her baby for the first time. It's as if to say, it was all for you. I've been caring about you before you've ever even seen my face. And it's the same way when, I believe, when we meet the Father and when we meet Messiah for the first time, when we meet people who have cared for us, uh, and even the Torah, who's been going through the generations, who's many times struggled in its own struggles to stay alive when the enemy would want to get rid of the words of God. And yet the word of God persisted and stayed there every day so that one day in the future, somebody like you could have the great privilege and blessing to be able to hold the words of God who you've never met 
in your hand because they were cared for like a baby in the womb and preserved up until that day for that moment when your eyes could be opened and you could look upon the words of God and and start a new relationship with your Heavenly Father. It's amazing is is what it is and for people who haven't ever had a child no book or diagram can explain what it's like until you've experienced that and I believe that's the same way it's going to be when we look even in fear and trembling when we meet Messiah and when we meet the Father for the first time uh, it's 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 going to be just a life-changing uh, unforgettable moment and so my message this year uh, for this parish is called preparing for judgment because this is the essence of what's going on and I'm going to compare it um, in many ways to some of or I'll use it to contrast some of the problems and patterns with some theology uh, not just in uh, Christianity and even among the Messianics and also in Judaism, um, really among religious people who follow uh, or use the Bible in one way or another. Uh, we're going to see that that there's a lot of uh, things that we do to make ourselves feel better in order to not deal with the real issues. There's many ways where it's easier for us to just say, okay, well this is just a parable. It's just about wheat and tares, and that's it. Don't trouble yourself talking about what else it could mean, because that would just, how do we know if we're right? That would require even more study and humility in our knowledge, when here we can take this and say, well, it's about wheat and tares, and that's all. And we can be proud in that, and we can be puffed up and, and say, I absolutely know this parable is about wheat and tares and nothing else. And I can tell you all the details about what was actually written there without having to go into that scary, unknown, unseen world of meaning and of understanding. And it's that world that's really walking on water. It's that world and the unseen, which is following the unseen God. And what did Israel want to do? They have a consistent pattern. Well, let's get us a king, right? It's much lesser than God as a leader, than the unseen God. But we can see it. And we don't have to think about the unknown, because thinking about the unknown and the unseen requires constant thought. It requires you to always be on, and never you never get that ability to, to puff up and be proud and go, oh yeah, I know, I know all about God. Really? Do you know all about the unseen God? You don't. It's much easier if you have an idol where you can go, oh, there's the idol. We know everything about it. We've observed it from every angle. We've defined it. We can put it in a box. We can move it here or move it there. It's all under our control. You see, these are the patterns in Israel. But following the true Elohim, that requires an all-the-time effort. Just like being a mother. Okay? Being a mother is an all-the-time effort. You don't get to say, well, I want to sleep in, so the baby's going to starve to death. Or, hey, I'm watching my TV show. So the kid's going to fall down the stairs, and that's their problem. Or, hey, I'm not going to prepare them food. You know, I'm just going to make myself something. You don't get that luxury when you're a parent. You have to take care of somebody else, and it becomes your responsibility. It's an all-the-time, 24-hour job. Well, studying the Torah, in my opinion, is the same way, and, and following God. And so I'm not one that's a big fan at all of saying, well, case closed. Here it is. It's the story of Esau and Yaakov. Here's the 10 facts about it. Now that we know it, let's just put that away. We don't really have to explore it, think about it. We don't have to do anything because we can clearly define it, put it in a box, turn it around, move it from place to place, and know exactly what it is. Well, I disagree. So let's dig in here. Um, and let's expand on it and start to understand what it what it uh, can also mean in the patterns that it creates. So we start off with um, the first thing is a message uh, sent in res as a response to fear. Now, in religion, you're going to see a lot of these patterns 
people don't want to admit it. It's so amazing to me. Um, I was watching a show the other day. The one roommate, it was these two gals, and the one roommate was complaining that the other girl makes all this noise. She's blow drying her hair all the time in the morning while the other girl's trying to sleep, and they're kind of stuck together, so there's nothing they can do. And the, the girl who was keeping the other girl up got all upset and saying, I don't do that. I only do that once in a while if I'm going somewhere. You know, you're just being rude and, and, and hating on me and doing all this and that. And the show then shows clips of her constantly doing that, right? All the time. And it's not because she's just going somewhere or a once in a while thing. And yes, she's making a lot of noise and doing all this. And it kind of, from a social science standpoint and, and just being a people watcher and observing the patterns that people do, it's it's a much deeper thing that made me that bothered me and made me laugh and 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 is ridiculous all at the same time is that people can't admit what's wrong with them they're like a cockroach with a flashlight last thing they want to do is shine the light on themselves they scamper away from it, right they can't even when it's not justified even when you do you did do that wrong well own up to it you know, at the point that somebody's going to call you out and say, hey, you did this. Okay. I mean, even in politics, they teach that. Look at this uh, this guy. I don't even know his name because I don't really care that much about politics. But the guy who said he was smoking crack and he's some, some guy. And those guys have handlers. Okay. And all they care about, they don't care about the truth or what's right and wrong. But they, they look at how things work and they'll manipulate it any way they need to. So one thing that they've learned, these handlers, these political handlers and, and, and spin doctors, they've, uh, and, and press and PR people, is they've learned, oh, well, the American people, it's okay if you make a mistake as long as you admit to it because they love the underdog story and they love the story of redemption. Okay? So since they know that, it doesn't matter if the guy is sorry that he did it or not. The fact is he got caught. And so 99% of the time, the response of their advisors is always going to be the same, is to say, okay, the best thing you can do is come out, admit it, admit that you were wrong, and and then focus back on the positive. Well, even though they're doing it to deceive the voters and the American people, the fact is there's that's even apparent even to the slimiest politician. And yet, as being the best course of action, and yet you can see it everywhere you go when you're dealing with people, just like with Torah study or Bible study or anything like that. You know, you can sit down, you can sit down with a Christian and start talking about, oh yeah, Messiah, he was the best ever, and oh, I just love, you know, he he loves us so much and all this, and um, I'm I'm so glad that. Oh yeah, I'm a sinner. Yeah, oh you're a sinner too. Oh yeah, it's so good. We need to, we need to, you know, be saved from our sins and and repent for that and 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 feel bad about that. All the way till the point that you get. Oh yeah, that's and and we need to keep the law, you know, and return to obedience to the law uh, of the Bible. You know, the law of the Old Testament. Oh wait a minute. Now we were all friends and we were high fiving and yeah, amen, brother, and all that. Until you say something that has implications on them. Until you say something that would mean that they would be accountable. Until you turn that flashlight on the cockroach and shine it on them and they're like, ah, and they scamper off there. Or the other way, the other thing that, that a cockroach might do is say, kill the flashlight, right? Religiously speaking, you're going to do one of two things. Right? It's fight or flight. You're either going to try and destroy the light that is shining on you if you don't like the light, or you're going to run away. Many people run away in the scriptures. They run away from the truth, right? That is Messiah, who also calls himself the light of, of the world, right? He's the light. It says people hate the light because their deeds are dark. Well, in Proverbs 6.23, it says the law is light. Now, do we have people who hate the law? Yeah. 
And why? Why is it that they've got to convince you that the law is done away with or that we no longer have to do that or that it was only meant for this and so now we don't have to... No matter what it is, it all comes down to one thing. Kill the light. Turn the light off. Because it would require them, the light would require them to walk in light. To walk as the Messiah did. They walk in darkness. How can light and dark be joined together? It isn't. The law, which is what the Messiah represented and lived perfectly his entire life, even unto death, never sinning. That's what he stood for. And so other people want to come. And there's a difference from repenting and trying and doing your best effort at obeying the law and not being good enough. That's not going to be turned away by Messiah. You're growing. You're not expected to, 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 to be perfect on day one and never make a mistake. Even That's why there's sacrifices. The very thing that Christians claim and hold to is the greatest thing of their doctrine, really, if you look at it, is the sacrifice of Jesus. But if you put that in biblical context, the sacrifice for other people's sins is part of the sacrificial system established in that Old Testament law that they seem to hate. That was already built in. It was built in that you're going to make mistakes and, and that there's going to be mercy and that there's going to be uh, payment and the ability to repent and to go back and learn in the mercy of time in order to make mistakes like a child and learn from it and grow up. Right? That's all built in. <clears throat> And it's on those premises and that foundation of the sacrificial system that that their whole their whole understanding of the New Testament relies on. I think they got it mostly wrong. They got the book, but they're not understanding it correctly because they didn't read the Old Testament. And the New Testament is discussions of the people who lived when the only Bible that existed was the Old Testament. So everybody's Bible in their hand, when you're reading in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're all holding an Old Testament. When they're having these conversations that later become the conversations and letters written of in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everybody in that conversation at that time, their scriptures, their Bible was the Old Testament alone. There's no New Testament at the time that that's written. It didn't exist. That's a pretty big fact, and I bring it up in a lot of videos. Why? Because until you get that thing right, you're going you're gonna to have a book that's not useful. Your New Testament is going to become of no effect if you don't understand it in the context of living with the Old Testament as the Bible. If you don't understand when it says all Scripture is, is good for reproof and correction and instruction, that at the time that's being written, the scriptures used at that time are the Old Testament. So most people say, oh, see, see, all the New Testament scriptures are good, but the Old Testament aren't. No, you're not even getting that correct. You're not even understanding the correct historical context of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all these things, and, and what the people counted as scriptures. And then when you take those verses that Messiah says, when he says, don't even think that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets, and yet all the people who read that go see he fulfilled it he did away with it. they think exactly what he said don't even think that it's kind of ridiculous and what is at stake the light the truth the scriptures say the torah is truth the law is truth okay messiah said he was the truth and it says he is the light. And Proverbs 6.23 says the law is light. Do you see what's happening here? Calls him perfect. Messiah was perfect. The Bible says the law is perfect. Okay? He's called the way. The Bible says the law is the way. If you add all these up, make one column. Here's all the things it says the Torah is, the law. Here's all the things Messiah's words he used to describe himself. Oh, 
It's an exact match because he was the living law, as it even says in the New Testament. He was the word of God, which at that time was only thing, only word of God there, only scriptures being used was the Old Testament. He is the living, the, the word of God made flesh. That is just taking the Old Testament, the law, the Torah, and putting it into a person. And that's what he was. He lived the law perfectly. He was the walking, living law. Now, when he says, don't even think I've come to do away with the law and the prophets, right? He's essentially also saying, don't even think I would come and do away with myself. Right? He's not doing away with himself. He's not saying, I don't count. I'm casting myself out. He's not coming saying, I've come. I was one way at one point, but now I'm changed. Right? Because the if he represents the word of God, what's the word of God say? It says, it changes not. You're not going to take anything away from it, and you're not going to add anything to it. Right? Because the truth is the truth. It can be revealed at different times, but it always remains one truth. So this whole idea that, oh, God made this law, but, you know, it seemed like it was too hard. Maybe he changed his mind. Maybe it wasn't that good of a law. He should have never made it. Oops, God made a mistake. Well, if God made a mistake, then his son should have come living the correct way without obeying the law. Right? He should have been living the way, whatever... The right way was. That's how he lived. But he did. He lived. Well, he did, technically. He lived according to the law. He never sinned. Sin is a breaking of the law, according to the New Testament and the Old Testament. That's how we define sin. So if he never broke the law, then the law is not broken. Because he was the law. Right? What did it say about him? None of his bones to be broken. Bones are the structure are the foundation of a man. And if he's the word of God, then guess what? None of those laws have been broken away. None of those scriptures have been removed, just like Messiah wasn't. They didn't cut his arm off or take his finger or break his bones. Okay? Now, what did the crowd want? They wanted him dead. They wanted the word of God, the living law, dead. You see, in that time, if he's the word of God and he's the Old Testament, then he is the law. He is the Torah. And many of the people who claim to be God's children said, we want to do away with the law, which is we want to do away with Messiah. That's what he represented. That's who he was. That's what he lived. And see, when you put it in that context, you realize that when someone's saying, oh, we're not under law, the law, right? but we follow Christ, it doesn't make any sense because Christ is the law. So when they're really saying, what they're really doing is they're saying, Psst, wolf, sheep's clothing. You see? Because only the wolves want to get rid and destroy the law. The law is the will of God. It's a representation of God on this earth in the same way Mashiach was a representation of God on this earth. And what did he represent? Breaking of the law? No, that was not a correct representation of God. Keeping of the law was a correct representation of God. But these are all very simple and very logical things to understand. And if I went and talked to an atheist and explained the two theories, or even a child, they would see that this one makes sense versus this one very disjointed and disconnected you're, you're you know god says a house divided against itself cannot stand but essentially you'd be saying that he was this way and then jesus his son came and did something different that's a house divided can't stand i mean there's so many ways that it just won't work that you could tell anybody who didn't have a pony in the show who didn't have a vested interest in it being one way or another who would just give an honest opinion because they don't care and they would say, oh, yeah, this makes more sense. But why won't it make sense to people? Because they're the cockroaches that don't want the light shined on their dark deeds. Because if they admit that the law is in place, they admit that they follow the unseen God. They admit that they have work to do. They admit that their choices matter. 
whether they sin or not matters. They admit that they're going to have to study more to learn what it is that God wants us to do and what he's wanted uh, his people in the past to do. And if he doesn't change, then those things there are these things here. Uh, that sounds like a lot of work. That sounds like I'm going to have to change things in my life. You mean I can't go and, and have my bacon burger anymore? My favorite bacon burger, I always go there and get it for $1.99. Yeah, that's what that means. You'll have to sacrifice. I know you, say you follow Messiah, who sacrificed, who was perfect and never did anything wrong. As a matter of fact, did everything right. And yet he was beaten and, 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 and tortured, essentially, and put to death and gave up his own life, never varying from obeying the Torah, right, or the law. He was willing to sacrifice all he had for you, but you're not willing to give up your bacon burger. Do you see? And all that reveals is just the relationship. He, God loves all these songs and worship music. Oh, God is great. His love endures forever. His mercy endures. Yeah, God is great. Oh, yeah, God does love. It's, it's people who hate him back. In particular, not just the enemies that you see out there as clear enemies, not the atheists or the Satan worshipers. His own followers hate him. His own followers refuse to even give up a bacon burger. Not only that, they're going to go back and try and use the word of God and twist it around to say, look, they're justified, right? They're a rebellious son saying, I am not going to obey you, and I am not leaving this house. I am going to tell everybody that I represent you, and that our relationship is great, but from me to you, I'm giving you the middle finger. I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to do what you said. I'm just going to pretend it doesn't count. It doesn't apply to me. And no, I'm not leaving. Well, the other people who say God's words don't count, or that they don't have to obey them are people oops sorry incoming call there um, the people who say that they don't have to they're not going to obey or that say those rules don't exist to me are the atheists and the Satan worshipers and the people who are at least honest enough to admit that they are contrary to God, that they do not believe in the relevance of God. They don't believe they have to obey any unseen God or keep any commandments. You see, at least they're being honest. What's worse is the ones that say, no, I'm a follower of God, but I don't have to keep God's commandments. Right? That's an enemy within his own house. That's the enemy that got inside. The enemy of God that got inside and is creating destruction in his own house. These are the ones that, you know, just like you had with the children of Israel when they made a golden calf. They are standing before God, claiming to be the children of God, and yet they are worshiping an idol and not obeying him and unwilling to obey the God who saved them, the God who they say they follow, the God they say they worship, but they'll find other ways to replace the things they don't want to do because they, you know, God said don't, don't uh, have idols. Well, they decided that law doesn't, doesn't apply anymore. That law's done away with. We're going to have idols now. And we're going to sacrifice to him and say, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. They want to have everything. They want to take everything and keep everything that benefits them. And they want to do nothing that requires anything of them. They don't want, if they lusted after creating a visual God, an idol, then even if they lusted after it, they could show their sacrifice to God by saying, you know, I'd really rather, you know, we can't see you. It's, it's just, it's, we always have to be aware 
We never know exactly what's going on. Wouldn't it be easier if we just had this golden calf? But you know what? You said no idols. So even though it feels like that would be easier for me, I'm going to go ahead and not do it because I'm following you. And you said no. Right? That's a sacrifice. That's offering a sacrifice. A sacrifice, just as the Messiah said, when, you know, he said, I would that this would pass from me. Right? He didn't want to go through that. He didn't want it. He didn't want to suffer and be beaten and die. He said he didn't. He said he wanted it to be passed from, passed from him. He says, but, not my will, but thy will. You see? Because he was following his father. He was following the will of God, which is also the Torah. Okay? That's even in the parts where he then was willing to give a sacrifice. He was offering himself. He was offering the choices that he wanted to do to give instead to God uh, what God wanted, not what he wanted. That's a sacrifice. So if Christianity is built all on this great sacrifice of Jesus, well, you better figure out what, when and what did Jesus sacrifice and what did he talk about? Because the sacrifice, the very moment, the very sacrifice he was talking about giving, he didn't want to do. But he relinquished and humbled himself and instead lifted up the will of God, not his own will. He was willing to do what was difficult. He was willing to do something. Okay, And so when we compare this and we bring this back to different religions, um, and, and religious people who say they follow this God of the Bible, you can see that those... Messiah, you can see, he did God's will instead of his will. He made the choice that God would want him to make, not the choice he wanted to make, or the easy choice, or whatever. Okay? So when we see this, we see that the message, what we do, how we respond to things that require something of us, that make us guilty, that are going to bring us harm, right? These are forms of tests to see if we'll follow God or not. And our response, uh, and a lot of the theologies, right? There's millions of people who believe all you do is say this little sinner's prayer, and you don't have to do nothing. You don't have to obey that. You don't have to think about what you're eating and then go back to the Word of God and, and eat the way God said to eat. You don't have to observe the Sabbath the way that God said to observe the Sabbath. You don't have to do all of these things that God said. Right? All you have to do is say this little thing and you can get all the benefits and all the blessings of God and His Son without having to pay for it. Without having any responsibility. You see? Now, it's interesting as we look at this week's parasha because Yaakov is coming back to Esau. And, you know, the birthright Esau sold that. That's a legitimate transaction. Nothing wrong with that. You don't want your birthright? You want to sell it to me for a bowl of porridge? Hey, that's on you. If you're angry, why are you angry? You sold it. Can you imagine going to the store and buying a pair of shoes and then the store owner is just irate after he sold them to you that, you that he doesn't have them anymore? And it's like, wait a minute. If you, why are you upset? You're the one who sold them. If you loved them so much or you wanted them, why would you sell them? You had no problem selling them. You fully knew what we were doing. It doesn't make any sense to be angry after the transaction that you made. You see? And that brings us to this, to this point, which is also a funny side point, which is part of the sinner's prayer, which isn't really a biblical prayer or anything, doesn't nowhere in the New Testament where it says that. Uh, it's just kind of made up by people. But, you know, you, you ask Jesus into your heart and you say you're, you're going to follow him and you dedicate your life to him. Well, you know what your life is? Your life is, is a series of choices over a time, over a period of time. Whether you're healthy or you're sick, as long as you're alive, you're making choices. Right? Just as Revelation says, I'm going to open up the book of life and judge every man according to their deeds. Right? Your deeds 
are just a result of your choices. You choose to do something. Okay? Just like Adam and Hava in the garden. Hava blamed the serpent, but the serpent didn't make Eve or Hava uh, eat the fruit. Just said maybe it's a good idea. She had to make the choice. Nobody forced her to do anything. But she didn't want to take responsibility for her choice. And her choice was to disobey God. At the end of the day, it didn't matter if a hundred serpents were saying, yeah, go ahead. You know, God said this, but I say the opposite. Who are you going to listen to? Well, she didn't want to listen to God. The end. Okay? You can't blame anybody. The devil didn't make you do anything. The devil might encourage it. The devil might say, boy, I hope you do that. That'd be great if you disobeyed God. But ultimately, you're responsible for your choice. And that's what this comes down to, is that Yaakov is coming back. And the other choice, when he dressed up as his brother and deceived his father to take the blessing, now that was different. That wasn't a transaction. Esau was going to get the food and come back and get the blessing. He took that from Esau. Okay? So now, Esau, right, is upset with him. And when they last left, Esau wanted to kill him after his father, or, yeah, after his father died. You know, he was planning on, on killing Yaakov. And, and so Yaakov's mother sent him away so that he'd be safe. Well, here you have someone trying to take something that wasn't really theirs, right? And one was given to him, and it's a great thing. There's something that you can legitimately earn, right? He earned the birthright because he made a transaction for it. He had ownership of that, legitimate ownership, that he could document. What he didn't have ownership of was the blessing. Okay? Um, that he stole. And now he's coming back and he's having to face his sin. He's having to face the person he stole from. And this can teach us a lot. Because, see, a lot of people believe in, in salvation in a way that doesn't line up with the scriptures. A lot of people, you know, believe it's this, uh, just forgive and forget, oh, Jesus did it all for us, so it doesn't matter how nasty we are, or how nasty we continue to be. Because we just get a constant wipe just by saying we believe in this guy. Well, then every Satan worshiper would be smart to just say, yeah, I believe in that guy. I'm good too. I'm gonna get to keep being who I am, keep going against God's word, but I believe in him. Who wouldn't, what idiot wouldn't get a free, if someone walks up to your door and says, I'm going to pay off all your credit card and pay off your mortgage. And you say, well, what do I got to do? And they say, nothing. Okay, great. Where do I sign up? Where do I sign up for something where I take something and give nothing in return? I don't have to change. That's a great sales pitch. It's hard. It's unbelievable. That's a great sales pitch. And that's why Christianity grows at the rate that it does. Because, and I'm not, don't get me wrong. People saying, what? Well, maybe you just don't believe in it. Maybe you just don't believe in Jesus' sacrifice. Oh, I believe in it. I just interpret it according to the Bible. And according to what sacrifices did. And according to the words of Messiah. And according to all the things. I take the whole book into account to put it in the correct context so that you can understand what it represented and what it meant and what my responsibilities are in, in relationship to his sacrifice. See, there's this little thing called repentance. And there's this other funny thing called the gospel, which is repent for the kingdom is near. And believing in Jesus means something. The problem is a lot of people define that as just acknowledging who he is, that he exists, as if as if to say, well, don't you think the enemies of God, if you're going to fight God, don't you have to believe he exists? Who, what, what military goes out onto the battlefield 
to fight an army in a battle that they don't actually believe is there? How many, how many armies come onto the battlefield and just start swinging around at nothing and saying, I do not believe you're there, but we must fight you. Okay, they don't. It's stupid. Just as the scriptures say in James. Even the devils believe and they tremble. Right? They knew who he was. They knew who Jesus was. Yahushua. And that didn't save them or give them any benefits or make them any better than everyone else, than the atheists. There's only two sides. If you're just totally ignorant to whether or not God exists or not, that's, that's just ignorance. But there's a war and there's a battle. And there's good and there's evil. That's it. And you're either good or you're evil. And if you're ignorant to the existence of God, then you can still measure your actions according to the word and the laws of God of whether or not they be good or evil. It doesn't matter whether you know about God. If you eat a ham sandwich or you murder somebody, then those would both still be violations of God's will, whether you knew it or not. If I had to look at it individually and say, is this action fit on the side of obeying God's will or disobeying God's will? Is this breaking the law or keeping the law? Everything could still be categorized in one of those two areas. Whether the person there is a worshiper of God, knows about God, nothing. Their actions, right? Just as it says, if they don't have the law, they're a law unto themselves. See, their actions still fit into a category. If they were running around stealing, murdering, and 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 raping, then they're a nasty person, whether they knew about God telling them not to do those things or not. That doesn't change them into a saint that just didn't happen to know God. So the fact is, is that all of these things, when we look at when we look at this this concept, what does this what does this free ride idea of salvation? What is the fruit of that teaching? Does it mean more people obey God, which is what repentance means? Repentance is to, to go back, to return. Well, if sin is breaking the law, the only opposite of that is keeping the law. There's one side or another. There's no middle ground. And so what a lot of bad Christian theology is taught is they say they believe in the gospel, but they never repented. They say they believe in Jesus, but they never repented. They never stopped sinning and started obeying the law, which is the opposite of sin. So if they didn't repent, but they believe in God, who is it that was wicked but believed in God? They're the same as the demons and the devils that knew that he was the Son of God. But that didn't change their actions. They were still wicked. And they were destroyed. They were thrown into the swine. They ran over the cliff. It may be a hard thing to hear. It may be inflammatory. Well, guess what? If you're inflamed by it, if you're bothered by it, don't argue with me. I'm nothing. Go back to the Word of God. Read the whole thing. Wrestle with it there. Okay? And always look at the fruit of your response. Because you can show me five verses that give you, make you think that you don't have to obey the law anymore. And I could show you ten verses that say that you do. Even in just the New Testament. So at the end of the day, it isn't about whether you could find something that, that, that can help you justify your position. What's the fruit of that position? The fruit of your argument is, see, I don't have to obey God's law. The fruit of that is, you won't be eating kosher. You won't be not stealing. You won't be uh, keeping the Sabbath. You won't be doing certain things of the scriptures, which just means you're going to just be racking up sins. And even the person who, who says, hey, we do have to keep the law. Well, they're going to sin too we're sinning. The difference is they're trying to remove that sin and do a better job and a better job and remove more sin and be more righteous and do more righteous deeds and things that God wants them to do. 
And they're becoming more like Messiah, who lived the Torah, who did righteous deeds, right? People who are keeping the law are becoming more like Messiah. So if I have to look at two groups of people and say, who are the followers of Messiah? Don't tell me, don't tell me a word. Let me just look at the people. Well, let's see. Messiah ate kosher, right? If he ate something unkosher, he would have broke God's law. He would have sinned, therefore not been perfect and not been the Messiah and not been a perfect sacrifice either. And you'd have no salvation from your sins either. Okay? If you don't know whether he, he, he sinned or not, then you really need to read the New Testament. Okay? He's sinless. That's defined as not breaking the law. Okay? So he never broke the law, which means he ate kosher. So if I'm eating kosher, and you're not eating kosher, and Messiah ate kosher, which one of us is like the Messiah? Which one of us is might be deemed as one of his disciples or followers? Well, the one who does what he did. The one who acts as he acts, who lives how he lives. That's how you know a disciple. Just as it says in the New Testament, a disciple, right, should be like their master. That's how you know, hey, that's one of his disciples. Not by the words they say, but by the way they act. That anyone observing them can see, wow, this guy eats kosher. This guy rests on the same day that that Jesus rests. This guy observes the same laws. This guy doesn't murder, doesn't steal. The, all of these different things line up exactly with the way the Messiah lived. I bet he might be one of his disciples. And look at this other person. I don't know anything about him, but he's lying. He doesn't rest on the same day. He doesn't eat the same way. This guy's nothing like that guy. And yet then if you go talk to him, oh, well, hey, this one says he's a follower of that guy and a disciple. Hmm. If I didn't know any better, I, I would call garbage on that. But I don't see any way you're similar to him. Oh, but, but I believe him. I know who he is. Yeah, but you're nothing like him. I mean, if you become an apprentice to somebody, you know, that's like an apprentice who says, I'm going to follow this guy around. I'm going to be a plumber or a carpenter. But he never shows up. He never lifts a hand, hammer to a nail. He walks around, but he never does what his master who he's supposed to be learning from and be like, he never does anything like him. Then what relationship exactly do they have? He's just someone walking around looking at the guy and being nothing like him. That's not a follower. That's not a disciple. That's just no different than any of the strangers who were standing in the crowd just wondering, oh, what's this guy talking about? Oh, that's not for me. But I saw him. He was talking and I was standing in the crowd. So what? That's worth zero. That means nothing. So a lot of times you say, well, why has this happened? Why could so many people be deceived? How can this happen? Well, the message, just like Yaakov, is a response to fear. You see, saying the sinner's prayer, it's a fruit of guilt. You might not have ever been religious, but eventually you realize, wow, I've done a lot of nasty things nasty things. I haven't been a very good person. Who is this Jesus that I could, uh, that, that might forgive me for all these things that I've done? Because I know I've done some nasty things. That we know the wickedness inside us and we have a fear in relationship to it. And what that drives us to do is that moment when people say, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for everything that I've done. They don't know Jesus yet. They don't know God. They have no relationship yet. They never even heard of him before that time. The only thing they step into is somebody who told them about this or told them about the Bible or told them about God and said something about, hey, did you know uh, somebody loves you and they're going to forgive you for all the nasty things you've done? And they created you. The person who created you is going to forgive you. And you know, all they come to the table with is, well, I know. I've done some... It's that fear. Well, I don't know. I haven't seen this God. I don't know this God. I never heard about this God yet. But I know about what I've done that isn't right. That's the law unto themselves. They know that when they stole, it wasn't right. Okay? 
And so they come knowing something was wrong, that they did a lot of wrong things. And their response to the fear that somebody out there is going to hold them accountable to that even if it's themselves knowing they want to get rid of that guilt and you're telling me if I say I believe in this God that I have no relationship or don't know instantly they get removal of their guilt and that's all they had they still don't know anything about God you could have told them that that you know a Twinkie was gonna forgive them for their sins and, and that the Twinkie created them and knows that they were a bad person and the person who never heard of a Twinkie before would come and say, okay. And then you say, well, what do I do? And they say, well, you say you believe in the Twinkie and accept the Twinkie into your heart. And it'll kill you. <laughs> and, uh, and you'll be forgiven. You could get people, I can guarantee you right now, you could go to a third world country somewhere and get someone to accept that a Twinkie forgives them for their sins and is their God. It sounds ridiculous. But the fact is, is the reason I bring that up is because when a person just says that prayer, they have no knowledge or relationship of God other than you told them there is a God, which has no idea in their minds because it's something foreign and new to them. Okay? But all they do know is they've got this huge amount of guilt of all the bad things they've done in their life. So you're coming and saying that X something X, Y, Z is going to remove that for them. If it wasn't for that, if there was nothing in it for them, why would they be doing anything? If you just came up and said, there's a magical Twinkie, you should believe in it. How many people are going to sign up? Nobody. What is in it for them? This is the flaw. This is the flaw that when you make a transaction, it means nothing. When you And when you aren't aware of why you're making that transaction, then you're fooling yourself and you're delusional. Most people get into Christianity because they want the guilt of their sin gone. They don't know why. They don't know a law. They don't know God. They don't know any of these things. And just because you say the word God it has no meaning yet, they've never even read the Bible. They don't know anything about God. You could have said any word. And they still would have signed up because the only thing of real substance that happened during that transaction was for them. They knew they had a problem with, with things they'd done wrong, and you were going to alleviate that with X. And if X, X is different things for a lot of people. X for some people is is other religions. It's Buddhism. It's 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 Islam. It's it's uh, Mormonism. It's Catholicism. It's Hinduism. There's all kinds of religions out there in the world. And the moment when someone gets into them, if they weren't born into it, if they just someone come and talk to them, there's an X factor there. There's some reason they're there. And usually it isn't about the religion. It's about something in it for them. In the case here that we have, it's forgiveness of sins, which is technically mechanically a removal of guilt that the sins have. Guilt is a great thing it's a great blessing among humans because when you do something wrong there's a piece of it that sticks with you and that you know that wasn't a good choice and that is a huge blessing because even without any law or religion it helps you be responsible for your choices and to learn and make better choices now now the bible is a great blessing because it then defines what was bringing about all that guilt. Well, adultery. Well, blessing after a one. Uh, you know, murder. Some of the things that were obvious that we knew brought guilt and new things that we didn't even know we were guilty of or didn't feel guilty. Now, what was worse? See, if I stole, I would probably know that there was something wrong with that. I didn't need a religion to tell me that. If you murdered somebody, you would know something was wrong with that inherently. Okay? Those are the gimmies. Those are the easy ones. Those are the merciful ones because we get to know there's something wrong. Just like Messiah said to the Pharisees, if you knew you were blind, 
then I could heal you. But because you say you see, your sin remains with you. See, the problem is not knowing your sin. That's a worse place to be than if you know your sin. You're better to be wicked and know it than to think you're righteous and you're really wicked. Then you're blind to it. Right? It's the same way with disease in the world. I mean, people don't know until they get something goes wrong and they go into the doctor and they said, oh, you got cancer. Now they know about it. Now they're going to clean up their diet. Maybe they'll stop smoking. They're going to exercise. They're going to do all these things now because they know about it. It's better for them to know than if, it, if they were totally ignorant to it till the day they die. You see? And this is the way religion plays this role. So when you come in and you see this concept of, of salvation and you're saying, okay, well, what's in it for me? Remove what's in it for me and see how many people want to follow God. You see, because this takes us into this week's parish. What we see, and I'll jump ahead a little bit, with the story of Shechem. He raped Dina. He created a relationship where up front he got what he wanted, even though it wasn't right, and eventually he's going to pay for that. He's going to pay for it with his life when the brothers of Dina come and kill him and his father and all the males and spoil them. And it happened from him raping this girl. And it doesn't matter what law you're under because these are two separate nations. It didn't matter if Israel's law was that you shouldn't rape somebody. Because now you have someone who's not under Israel's law that come, came and did something wicked and paid the penalty for it. Okay? And it didn't matter if it was Israel's penalty, but ultimately it was. The person who they wronged, it was their rules that defined the judgment that would come back on them. Right? And in the same way, we have with Esau and Yaakov. Yaakov wronged Esau and stole his blessing. Now Esau could come back and try and kill him. He's going to set the He's going to set the bar where it is. He could take all of his possessions. He could take his wives and children from him. He could beat him. He could cast him out. He could cut off two of his arms. Uh, there's all kinds of things that he could do. As the person who he wronged, that person is going to determine, it's going to be based on the judgment of the person who you wronged that's going to come when they meet back up with you and determine how they want to repay you. Okay, that's a mechanic that is across the board. So in the case of these two nations, uh, these guys came and wronged and raped Dina and the, the two sons of Israel came and they determined what they were going to do in response to that. Now, what we see here when we start getting the concept of salvation as as interpreted by by many Christians, um, you have this concept where if they were Yaakov, they'd want to just stroll right back into Esau and say, "Hey, we're cool, bro." Just like they want to walk up to Jesus and say, "Hey, high five it," even though they've wronged right him and his father. They've wronged his father by sinning before they knew him. And then all the sins that they were doing after they knew him, after he s has sacrificed himself for them, and then they and then they said, you know, we're going to believe in you. We're going to say we're going to be in your house. We're going to be say we're your followers, but we're not going to follow you. We're not going to do what you did. We're not going to be like you. Not only that, we're going to actually teach against the law of your father that you loved so much that you lived even unto your death and kept. We're going to defile that, that thing that is most identified with you. The law is identified with Jesus more than any human being that ever lived. Okay? Just let that soak in. There is nobody who ever walked the face of the earth that the law of the Old Testament can be more perfectly in line with and identified with than Jesus of Nazareth. 
Okay. In Hebrew, Yehush. Okay. So you're telling me that your master, the person you follow, who you say you're a follower of and a disciple of, is the greatest representation of obedience to the law that has ever lived in history. And you think that by saying that it is nothing, which would be saying that his whole life's work and every action he ever made was nothing, it was done away with, it was not good enough, therefore it should be cast out, that it was it was not worthy, it was a mistake, nobody can keep it, it was it was ill-built and put together without the awareness that nobody can do it. It was some kind of mockery of man just to show them how nasty they are because they could never attain something so good. I mean, every time people talk about it and doing away with it and how bad it is and how it's a curse if you try and keep it, well, let me ask you, was Messiah cursed? Maybe to the people who hated the law who hated Messiah, right? The living word of God. What did they say? He saved others, but to himself he cannot save. They mocked him. He, he was the living word of God. He was the law. And they were mocking him. That it wasn't good enough to save itself. And that is the same argument, the same thing people treat the Old Testament law with. When they say, well, that was just for them, and they knew it was a mistake, and it wasn't good enough to live, to survive into the New Testament. You see, there's a hundred ways people don't understand which role they're playing. A wolf in sheep's clothing, in the religious world, eventually thinks it's a sheep. But look at the teeth. What is it that they are gnashing at? Is it grass? Or is it flesh? Are the mouths of those people who say that they're following Jesus saying the word of God that you should obey God and obey every word out of his mouth and keep the commandments? Or are they telling people don't keep the commandments? Because you see you got an enemy to God and, and, you, got a, and you got a supporter of God. Now Jesus was a supporter of God, therefore he represented God and he lived according to the commandments. And he didn't sin. And guess what? He taught other people to, to repent from their sins, which would mean returning to obeying the law. He represented his father. You've got other people out there, just as you did back in the time of the Gospels, who were saying, well, wait, we're the religious people and, and the followers of God, and we're telling you that this man's false. You don't have to listen to him, and you don't have to obey him. As a matter of fact, they're going to do away with him. You don't recognize the incredibly awkward pattern there? That most Christians are playing the role of the Pharisees who wanted to kill Jesus. They just don't understand it. They've become deluded by their own response to the fear of their own sin. The only the own response that if they say that they have to keep the law, it means they're they're accountable and that Messiah's sacrifice wasn't to remove the punishment and to justify sin and wickedness. Instead, it was to give you a second chance at striving for righteousness. But that requires your effort. You then, right? He saved your life, and now it's on your plate to save it from here on forward. Because when you're like him, then him through you is continually saving your life again every time you obey the Torah and turn from wickedness and repent, right? And and start obeying. What did he say to the person who he healed? He said, go and sin no more. That's go and don't break the law, the Torah, anymore, lest a worse thing befall you. So he was forgiven for what he did in the past. But what he does going forward, it better be in alignment with the Torah. He gave him a second chance. And that's what the sacrifices do. They give us second chances and third chances. But you know what? When you die, chances are up. You better have made an effort to do it. Because the sacrifice doesn't cover the unrepentant sinner. Look it up. Examine.
That's why he sent away the Pharisees who came down to him wanting to be baptized. He says, who told you, you know, about the wrath? He says, go and bring back fruits worthy of repentance. It wasn't about, don't come and get dumped. Don't say you're saved for no purpose and you're still the same wicked person you were. Go and prove that you've changed. Then this will mean more because it will be in alignment and representative of the fact that you changed, that you repented, you stopped those sins, you no longer steal. Now I can come and dunk you, right? Now you're being cleansed because you went down one way a thief and you came up no longer a thief, which meant you came up in obedience to God's word. When you went down, you were in disobedience and against and contrary and an enemy of God's commandments. It's that simple. Again, if I explain that to a child, the child wouldn't think that the person who you do wrong to will then reward you for being naughty against them versus, well, you made it right and you stopped doing that thing, well, then will, should they forgive you? Oh, yeah, they should forgive you if you're no longer doing that. You said you're sorry. I mean, this is basic, guys. So Yaakov knows he did wrong and he's afraid. And so he sends a messenger first, right? He just, it's like getting ready to take a shot and you kind of pinch yourself to kind of build up here. Okay, here it comes, something, it's much worse, but let, I want to prepare myself for it. And, and a lot of uh, Christian theology is you did the first right thing, which is to realize what you've done many times in your life was wrong. That's the start of repentance is you first have to become aware that there's a problem. Then quickly you're told a lie which is that now that you have this right membership what you do doesn't matter anymore that's the opposite of why you came you came knowing that what you did wrong mattered and a lot of times what then uh, Christianity can teach is that you go away with the with the underlying doctrine that you know, you're saved now and you can never lose your salvation. And now that you believe in Jesus, you know, you're just going to get rewards when you die. And don't worry about, there's no real responsibility. Right? It's all ambiguous. Just do what you feel is the Christian thing to do. And that's going to be good enough. It's a load of garbage. Biblically, it's a load of garbage. Because that's essentially, their doctrine is Jesus healing the person. And not saying go and sin no more lest the worst thing befall you. They're saying the opposite. Go. It doesn't matter if you sin because now you've been healed by Jesus. Well, that's not what the scriptures say. So the fact is, is that we have to get back into the scripture. So Yaakov knows that something's wrong. And he sends out the messenger because maybe, just maybe, he'll come back and go, you know what? I've forgiven you. You know, he'll get the Christian response. Look at the salvation response, and everything's cool. Aesop just, uh, you know, even though you wronged me, you're not going to have to deal with anything. Just come back, be in my presence, and uh, everything's going to be great. Well, he's coming back with 400 men. Okay? The 400 men is like reading the scriptures in Revelations where it says he's going to open up the book of life and judge everyone according to their deeds. Right? You're going to be judged according to every choice that you make. When it says be careful of every idle word you say will come into judgment. It's all the dumb things and I know I'm guilty of tons. I'm going to have to pay for it. It says the beginning of wisdom, the fear of yod or the fear of God, is the beginning of wisdom. Okay? That's the messenger coming back saying, he's got 400 men. You can say what you... You can think what you want about what that means. You can think what you want about everyone. The book of life will be opened up and everyone, not just the unsaved or however you want to twist it, you can think anything you want about what the 400 men represent. But I'll tell you what, Yaakov probably figured out that 400 men with him didn't represent a big group hug. And he's happy to see me return. 400 men probably meant he wasn't ha he's still not happy with me and wants to kill me. Okay? So when you read that, the scriptures, even in the New Testament, you're going to realize there's a lot of verses that tell you 
that you don't want to be, that you're going to be judged and you're going to be responsible. And so you can walk around all you want and thinking, ah, 400 men, I bet they're all really nice people. You can think, oh, I'm going to get blessings and high fives from Jesus. Because, you know, I believe in him and he knows my heart. He does. He knows how wicked it is. And you're delusional to how wicked it is. You don't even know what wickedness is because you haven't studied the Bible. Know what God defines as right and wrong, which he defines with this commandment. The more you study the scriptures, the more you'll know what wickedness is and the more you'll know how wicked you are and where you fall short. And that's not just, oh, that's where people go, well, see, it says here, you know, he didn't know sin until, he, until the law. And then their idea is, okay, now I know sin, so let's get rid of the law. Let's get rid of the one who makes me, who told me the right way to be because I'm not that way, right? It's the light. The law is the light, as Proverbs 6.23 says. It tells you what sin is. And then people go, oh, well, see, now it told me that I'm a sinner because I just figured out I'm not supposed to be having a ham sandwich. And what? there's two responses. I can stop eating a ham sandwich and start eating kosher according to God's word and be like Messiah. Or B, get rid of the light. Get rid of the law. Because the law is telling me I'm wrong. And I see it all the time. What happens? You know, people, you say something to somebody about the scriptures or something they don't like that makes them, the fruit of it is that they'd be responsible and that what they do matters and every choice they make matters and can be either acceptable or unacceptable to God. And that salvation doesn't work the way they thought it does. And what, oh, unfriend, block, I'm going to delete that comment, right? That's the same pattern. Get rid of the one making me feel bad because I'm choosing my sin and wickedness over repenting and changing and, and being more like God, more like Messiah and obeying the word of God. It's the same response no matter what and who has it. So when someone just really wants to say, well, wait, Galatians says this and that, and eventually they get so upset that they unfriend you because you're trying to tell them that's not what that means and you probably need to read the whole Bible. Well, guess what? A lot of people are going to get unfriended because that is the Pharisees asking, are we blind? They don't believe they're blind. They believe that there's something wrong with what you're saying and they want to discredit you and destroy what you're saying instead of looking in the mirror. You know, the only way you benefit is to look in the mirror. If, if I was wrong and you decided to stop eating the ham sandwich, are you, you going to get punished for not eating a ham? There's nowhere in the New Testament it says, if you uh, don't eat a ham sandwich, you shall be burned in hell. We get the choice. Even the Christians start with the fact that they think it doesn't matter what you eat. I can eat chicken one night and ham another night. So why, if that's the case, wouldn't you eat chicken every night? Because then if you're wrong, you're still right and you're safe. But if you're not wrong and you could have eaten ham or chicken, there's no foul for eating chicken. I might just grow to like chicken and beef. It cost me very little to guarantee my, my answer and know I'm going to get the reward and know I'm going to be in the right spot. But when you do the other, you're, you're a gambler because you're going to say, no, you're being defiant. You're saying, I have chosen, you don't, you don't take away my freedom to eat what I want to eat, even though the very first sin in the whole Bible was God telling him you can eat everything, but he takes one simple tree and says, look, anything you want, go ahead and eat it, just don't eat from that one tree, right? It's almost like, to me, it's like a test. It's, it's the most simple test. Like, it's not like he says... You can only eat these three things, and then I'm going to surround you with thousands of other things that look great to eat. But nope, no, 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 because you're going to learn to obey me. It's not like that. He gives them everything except for one thing. Surely, if you had 99% of everything that there was to eat, why would you care about that 1%? But this reveals the wickedness in man's heart. This reveals the rebellion because we don't want someone telling us what we can do and what we can't do. 
We want to be in charge. We want to have the final say. Not serving God. It's a servant who lifts up his head and says, I will not bow down to you. I am my own person. We can cohabitate God, but I'm not beneath you, really. Now, I'll tell you, you know, you know, yeah. I'll give you your honor as much as I feel you deserve. But in the points that I don't want to, I'm not going to. Because I'm the master of myself, not you. And I will decide what honor I will give to you. And that's what you'll take and nothing more. You see, that's the language that people are speaking when they're defiantly saying, you know what? I'm going to keep eating my ham sandwiches. I don't think God cares what you eat. That's just a justification to justify them to do what's really underlying, which is saying, I'll determine what I'm going to eat, not God. And I'll determine what honor I give to God and what not. And that's how most religious people operate. They give the honor to God in the areas they want. Oh, yeah. You know what it says right here? It's just like, it's just like TBN. They run off and and pull up a quote from the Old Testament, even though they don't really believe in it. But when it comes to telling about tithes, and they want to get people's money, then they quote from the Old Testament. When people put their kids in Sunday school, you know, it's fun to hear the stories of Noah's Ark. Even though he had to differentiate between the clean and the unclean animals. Well, we don't believe in that law. But we'll teach our kids that story, you know, because it seems like a nice story. But... They'll give honor to the parts of that story that serve them. Because, you know, my kids are going to make noise and I want to shove them off to go into Sunday school where they're out of my way. And and they can go over there and learn the stories of Noah. But when they get older, we'll, we'll explain to them how none of that stuff really matters in the Old Testament. It's all done. Right? They're going to give honor to God only how they decide to give honor to God. Just like the children of Israel who made the golden calf. And they were still willing to sacrifice things, right, to give up things and sacrifice things to that idol, because that was okay with them. But not having the idol, you know, I think we got our own idea. We will honor God the way we darn well please. That's been the problem with the followers of God since the beginning. And it defines what sin is and rebellion. And sin and rebellion it's nothing new. And sin and rebellion isn't what's outside of the Christians or outside of the Jews or outside of the Messianics. Sin and rebellion is what the, most of the Bible is talking about what's happening among the people who say they follow God. Ding, ding, ding. Light go off. This isn't about, oh, the Bible is just a great story about how once people decided to follow God, they were so awesome and snowflakes and butterflies and look how great they are and all the rewards they're going to get. But now it's just about how nasty all those other people are. I can't believe they're not part of the followers of God. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible is a message about how God's people continually go into rebellion and God curses them and kills them and punishes them. And they're the ones that say they're following him. And they're the wicked ones. Oh, there's some wicked people outside of there. But the majority of the story is about the people of God and their wickedness and how he's trying to get them to obey him and his own people to obey him correctly. And that's even what the New Testament Messiah comes back and all the people who were supposed to be the religious people and the followers of God, they weren't following God correctly. So he's trying to correct them and their response is they want to kill him and get rid of him. They want to kill the truth and get rid of the truth so they can continue to have their religion. And nothing's changed. So we get into the fact that he divides up the bands, right? And this has a funny kind of thing because he's saying essentially, well, if one group is destroyed, I'll get away with the other. Right? And it's kind of a, even though it might be an okay strategy, don't you feel bad for that group that was up front? It's the same way in many ways. And the Christians say, you know what? Well, we have the Bible, but if we have to let part of it go, let's get rid of that law that required something of us. And and let's keep the part we like. And you'll notice, right? You'll notice that he's going to have to make a choice of who goes in front and who goes in back. And this all goes from the previous parashahs where he took Leah, right? 
who actually gave him sons and was being more of a blessing to him as a, as a wife, but the one he wanted, who hadn't produced any fruit, right, any children, he loved her more than the one who was getting the results. And so it's the same way when you start saying, well, who would I rather have? And the Christians essentially believe that Messiah is going to choose the ones that didn't give any fruit. Right? Now what did he do to the fig tree that had no fruit? Did he say, oh, I'm going to bless that tree, or does he curse it? Right? Because it's about having fruit. Fruits of righteousness. Just like he had. A tree is going to welcome one who's just like him. Not one who's cursed and withered. He's not going to take that diseased plant and bind it to himself so that he would be defiled. Doesn't work. Messiah, who's the model of the high priest, isn't going to join himself to a harlot or to a whore. He's not going to say, well, it'd be good for the whore, because I'm so holy that maybe if I join myself to this disease-ridden whore, maybe she'll be a little bit more of a person and a better person, right? See, people always say that. They say, oh, see, in the New Testament, he sits with whores and tax collectors. What they fail to understand is, no, he's sitting with people, number one, who he's giving, who, who he calls he came for the sick. That would be the wicked. And he's calling them to repentance. And the people who stay with him are those who repented from those things. The Pharisees thought they were righteous, but as he told them, none of you keeps the law. They'd, either, they'd made a bunch of rules that weren't even part of the actual truth of the law, and they obeyed themselves in their own man-made rules. And they thought themselves better than the whores. And, those, and, and the whore who was repentant and willing to come there and repent and return to obedience of the Torah was better than the Pharisee who self-justified himself, wasn't really obeying the Torah, and who was unrepentant. It was more defiling for him to be around those people than the repentant by measuring according to Torah and righteousness. And that's the same thing. How many people come in and say, have a high mind? Oh, well, I'm a Christian. And look at this person, it's a non-believer. You know, I'm better than they are. If that person, if that atheist recognizes the need to keep the law and commandments of God, even though they may choose not to, and the Christian says, hey, we believe in God, but we don't keep, have to keep the commandments. That atheist is just slightly ahead, in my opinion, than the Christian, who in a way mocks God and says, I'm your follower, yet I... I refuse to obey your commandments. They're either the same, which then again, at least the atheist knows he doesn't follow God. He's not, the atheist isn't running around claiming to follow God. That's why he doesn't do keep the commandments. The awkward part is the ones who say they follow God and don't keep the commandments. Just as it says, if they say they love me and keep not my commandments, there's no truth in them. They're not true. Because that would be a lie. Just as he said to those who said, we're the seed of Avraham. He said, if you were Avraham's seed, you would have Avraham's works. Not you would believe in Avraham or you would have his DNA or any other thing. They may have been the descendants of Avraham. But if they don't have the works of Abraham, they're not his seed. Because they're not like their father. They've become someone else. And it's worse for them, who was the living seed of Abraham, to then not have the works of their father and have works of wickedness. They are bringing shame to the name and they have followed the leadership of themselves or another man instead of their father. And they are acting like Satan and not their father. That's worse. That's sad. It's tragic. I don't say these things as a judgment on 
Judaism, Christianity, or Messianics. Because as long as you have a breath of life in you, you can still choose and make a change. I'm nothing more than commentary and speculation. But if that speculation causes you to question something and wake up and open your eyes from a lie that you were believing, and you go and study it and you find that there's more support that you may have been wrong and that changes you, then great. And if you go and study and you look at the food of it and you say, I just can't see this and, and this doesn't make sense and, and I think I'm producing more fruit doing something else, that's just your choice. You don't have to like it or dislike it, anything else. The Bible and the truth has been around. Look, Mashiach was called the truth, right? He's the truth walking around. And even him being a man, this isn't a Bible that has pages that you have to interpret. He was a man who walked around. And, and having all that truth, was it enough to convert everyone who he talked to or heard his message into being a godlike person? No. Can I do better than the Messiah? No. Many people have the Bible. They have the Word of God. The greatest information in the universe. They have it right there in their home. Does it somehow change them, everyone who lives in that home, into, into a son of God or into this? No. Possession doesn't come by being a descendant of somebody, or by being part of a group, or by saying you're a Christian or a Jew. The value, just as Paul talks about, the then, then what does the circumcision, what is the value of the circumcision then? Is it of none effect, of no value? No. It's the value you put to it. If you're a, a, a descendant of Abraham or Avraham, good for you, but it doesn't mean anything. The value of Abraham was in who he was and how he acted and the relationship he had with God. If you act that way and have that same relationship with God, awesome. Then some of that greatness can be transferred over to you. But if you run around and you're just a, a, a pagan, wicked, nasty person, don't brag about Abraham because you're nothing like him. And don't brag about Jesus, who was the son of the living Elohim, the living God, who obeyed his God, uh, his father's commandments, and, and did even in difficult times, was faithful and did all that, and had the faith and belief and did the will of his father. Don't brag about that if you're not doing it, because we already know he's great. But that has nothing to do with you until you make it have something to do with you until it changes you. Otherwise, that seed, right? The Word of God's like the seed, parable of the sower. That seed, it's a great seed. There's no question it's the best seed. But that seed goes into ground. It goes into people. And in some people, it's worthless. It produces nothing. And in others, it produces great things. It was not about the seed and how great, whether you believed in the seed or the seed was, was from God or anything like that. That was never in question. The only thing that changed the outcome on all of those is what we do with the seed. What does that seed mean to us? And what is our fruit from, okay, I read the word of God. Well, then what's my fruit? Many times I'll ask people who say some of the dumbest things. And I'll be like, have you ever read the whole Bible from page one all the way to the end? A lot of them don't answer. A few of them will say yes. And I would guess that only a portion of those are telling the truth. Because sometimes when you're in an argument, you don't want to be you don't want to be caught. It's like being caught red-handed. They realize that they're making this big, bold, strong argument, and that I ask them a question like, have you read the whole Bible from page one to the end? They're probably going to have to say no, and they don't want to say no because it makes them look like they're not very smart arguing so strong about something they've never read which is usually the truth. And so some of them say, yes, I have. Then you can ask a follow-up question. How long did it take you? You can, you can start to find out real quickly that they're lying. Because 
It's not a guarantee, right? Like the seed. They could have read the whole word of God and still come out with dumb conclusions. But it's just less likely. And usually you can see the hints of the fact that they don't know the word of God very well. They don't know the whole book. They don't know how it flows together. They don't know the details of stories. They get them confused. They mix them up. They leave parts out. They don't understand. They don't have a knowledge of it. They just have seen the information before. That's different than knowing. It's like math. Can you imagine if you said, hey, well, do you know your, your you know, addition? And someone goes, yeah, well, what's two plus two? And they say three, three probably three and something, three, a little over three. They're close, but they don't really know it because the answer is four. Three is close to four than one. If they said one, they're further away. But there's a right and a wrong answer. And when it comes to knowledge, having very random, fuzzy, not quite correct recall of the scriptures is a problem because then you don't actually have it correct. And if you, and, and it takes years to be able to memorize specifically what the scriptures say and then understand the context of a whole book or a whole parish. That's why we're doing these. So do you start to dig in and fill out the edges and get an understanding, uh, a deeper understanding. Even if you disagree with an analogy I make about a pattern, it doesn't matter because that's one more analogy you've heard potentially about the scriptures. Now you know exactly where you disagree with it, which gives you a deeper knowledge of the scriptures, let alone the surface story and all of that. How much time have you spent with this particular piece of text? That's why it's... It's amazing when you can get a chance to do the Torah reading, uh, you know, every year, because you get to come back to that scripture every year. That's why I created a whole Bible study binder system around the scriptures so that I could see all of my notes year over year of what I thought. And I can add to them and see what I learned last year, because I'm going to keep coming back and back and get deeper and deeper and more expansive and more expansive and see more patterns and do more things. And that's how you get depth of knowledge and that's why when someone can talk about a story and they say something and I'm like I don't think that's how it goes oh no I'm pretty sure oh, okay well let's pull up the scriptures oh I guess that's not how it goes it doesn't say that oh and it's like yeah oh you don't know because your time in the word in that particular piece of scripture very limited and your memory of it even worse and then that's not just that scripture. You don't know the other scriptures, so you don't have the context of the order of things that were going on, of the patterns that are going on, of everything surrounding it. And then it, in comparison to all of the whole scripture. So yeah, you're at a severe handicap when you don't study enough, when you don't study the word of God enough. You're at a severe handicap. You're speaking ignorantly, probably. Even if you study it a whole lot, still going to be tons of gaps in, in ignorance. But it's really apparent when you talk to most people. Okay, Fellowshipping, not better. Going to a congregation, don't care. You want to dance and do Davidic dance and, and sing songs in Hebrew and all this and that, I don't care. What people lack is studying the Word of God enough. They don't know the word of God. That's the centerpiece. If you don't know that, everything else is pretty stupid. It's not the point. The point isn't to put on a talit and walk around saying oy vey. And I see it all the time. You see new messianics and all this and that. And, and you just, you know that the first thing they do is start uh, singing Hava Nagila and lighting candles on Shabbat and all these different things that have nothing to do really with the Word of God. What they need to do is take that zeal and that desire to be associated with God and put it into studying His Word, studying the whole Word. And that's not something you're going to do in one day just because you want to. Well, I can get on Amazon or I can go to a Judaica store and order a tallit and feel like, look, I'm getting into the Hebrew roots and look at me. Oy vey. It means nothing. 
It means nothing when you don't know the Bible, when you don't know the Torah. That's the thing of value. Everything else is just a clean sepulcher. It doesn't matter. you got to work on the truth first and get to that truth and study and dedicate your time and make a real commitment and grow in depth of understanding and see the patterns and the scriptures and the context and the connections and study words and do all this stuff. And when you when that becomes your foundation, you're going to you're going to find the beautiful things and the glorious things. And it's going to be harder for you to have a conversation with people because they're going to come at you like guns a blazing with their understanding of the scriptures, which is so shallow, you know, that a gnat would drown in it. And they don't know that. They think they're deep as the ocean. They think they got it all figured out. You know, that takes us into this week's prayer shot, which was not only did he separate into two bands, then he sent out gifts, right? Which is like the fruit worthy of repentance. Gifts in this example would be acts of righteousness, keeping the Torah. Look, oh, I wasn't eating kosher. Now look, here's the fruit. Here's the gifts. I did you wrong, Messiah. I was breaking your God's commandments, the commandments you lived by, and I'm going to be your servant. And the first thing I'm going to start doing is, look, I didn't, I didn't order that ham sandwich. I ordered a chicken sandwich instead. No more ham sandwiches for me. No more bacon burgers. That's just like Yaakov who sent the gifts out, hoping that that would start to create a relationship between someone you once wronged. And yet people think they can come to Messiah, not God. See, they'll say, oh, well, I'm going to the Father, and Messiah is the mediator, and see, he's that gift going for me, and then I come up behind and everything's great. Okay? What about Messiah? How do you approach Messiah? What is your gift to Messiah? Saying you believe in him? Everybody who approaches him believes there's a man standing there. The Satan worshiper who approaches him believes in him. That's not the same as following him or being his disciple. That requires being like him and making different choices. Okay? It's totally different things. So, when you see the gift that you bring to Messiah, it's your obedience to the Torah. It's saying, hey, I'm like you. We have a relationship. I know I've done wrong, but let's. where's the middle ground between breaking the commandments, which is sin, and keeping the commandments, which is righteousness, which represents Messiah? Well, that would probably be, if I was making a step towards him, I would probably, oh, sure, I'm not keeping all of the commandments probably right, but look, I started not eating a ham sandwich anymore. That's taking a step that's a gift that brings the two closer together. You're taking a step away from wickedness and a step towards righteousness, which is where he stands in righteousness. And every step you take is a greater gift presented. Remember, he sent out the flocks and the herds, and he didn't just send them all as one big group. He sent them and said, okay, present these, and then move that, and then there's a whole nother one. Then we're gonna go the next one, and we're gonna do this to show, because I want to show you in every, as many times as possible before I meet you, that I'm sorry. Right? And we do that with our righteousness and commandment keeping. You know, oh, those are filthy rags. Well, you don't even understand what a filthy rag is. It's actually a menstrual rag, which is what that word means. And the menstrual rag, right, is proof of the cleansing of the cleansing of blood that you've gone through your cycle and been cleansed. So if your righteousness is as filthy rags, right, then it's been cleansed by blood. Blood is a model of teaching. Blood is a cleansing from the inside, right? And that cleansing needs to happen. The cleansing on the inside is just like, that's why you can't just come with outward righteousness, because he'll see what was the motivation of that. Just like he said, if you look on a woman of lust, you're guilty of adultery. So just coming to him and saying, look, I haven't slept with another man's wife. Well, he'll look on the inside. That's the outward. Technically, you might be right, but that doesn't mean you're not an adulterer. You're not guilty of anything, because you may have been looking on that woman with lust, and he can look at the blood. He can look at your righteousness, and not just see the, the 
outer garment, right? Garments are a model of righteousness. So when it says your menstrual rags, that's an outer garment that goes on you, but then you bleed upon it, okay? You go through a cleansing cycle of blood on the inside. If you brought to him, right, a, a white rag and said, this is my righteousness, this is my this is my menstrual rag, and there was no blood on it. Then how do I know that that's true? You might have just brought me any white rag. As a matter of fact, if it's a menstrual rag, I should see the blood on it. If you come to me and show me, hey, look, I'm outwardly not committing adultery. Well, then how do I know if that's true or not? Technically, you haven't physically done it, but spiritually, that doesn't reveal what's inside if the cleansing has happened inside or not because you could be looking on the woman with lust in your imagination and wicked imagination on another man's wife and I wouldn't know that you haven't been cleansed that you're filthy and that you haven't had your cycle yet that cleanses you that's why outward righteousness is the easy one Inward righteousness is a different thing. So if your righteousness is as filthy rags, right? Which is which is actually menstrual rags. Number one, it in itself is still unclean. You can't get haughty about what you've done. But it's also a proof of, of a cleansing cycle that you're going through, right? And they you used to do the same thing. Right? A menstrual rag in, and I know I'm going on a tangent here, kind of a funny one, but a menstrual um, rag or, or garment that you would wrap around during that time is, is what was filthy in, in that uncleanness of that blood while you were in that time of separation and you're supposed to be getting clean. You were unclean at the time. And that's what the whole menstruation cycle, it's a time of uncleanness. In Hebrew, it's called nidah. It's a time of separation. When you're separated, you can't have relations with your husband during that time. Just like people think they have this great relationship with Mashiach, even though they're totally sinning. They don't realize they're on their time of separation. Where they have to go through this cleansing cycle before they can actually be joined to their husband. And there's garments that you wear during that time. Why? Because everything she sits on, if you look at the laws, uh, uh, if she sits on, and, and, and especially with that blood, if that blood touches something, it defiles, it makes it unclean. And everybody else who's around could be defiled by that uncleanness as she's going through her process. Okay? How about our righteousness? When you're just learning the Torah and you don't know that much, you think you're doing something that's right. Your righteousness, in that case, is like filthy rights because it might defile somebody else into thinking that that's the right thing. But see, you don't know because you're still a newbie and you're still learning and we're all students. But the fact is, is that garment still serves a purpose. It still serves a purpose. And it also, when you're finished, shows, it's it's removed, and it shows that you're ready to be joined to your husband. Because you've gone through your cycle of cleansing and your separate time of separation. There's a lot deeper meaning to that. It actually is encouraging you to be righteous while you're away from your husband and to be cleansed. And that the time would come when you would be able to remove those garments and be set aside and be able to be joined again with your husband. But not until you're cleansed. And so many people are not, as it says, they wash themselves with much soap and yet their sin remains with them. Right? They're still defiled. This is the problem. So when you get to the rape of Dean, you see, or, or actually at, with Yaakov, you get to the humility and salvation. See, he bows seven times. He keeps bowing, bowing, going before them, bowing. That's talking about humility. How many people are submitting?
to the law? How many people are submitting to the commandments of God? How many people are are looking when they were going to eat a bacon burger and saying, no, I'm not going to have a bacon burger. That's like bowing down before they ever get back to Messiah. How many people are humbling themselves when Messiah is not even there? On their way back to Messiah, how many are humbling themselves? How many are sending gifts? and offerings, and how many are humbling themselves, just like when you study the Word of God. How many times do you say, no, nope, I got it all figured out, I just read this over here in Galatians, says I don't have to do this. How many are humbling themselves and saying, no, I'm probably, the wickedness of my own heart probably wants me to believe it's that way. Let me go read the whole book, and let me not try and assume I know what it's meaning, but just try and grasp what it's saying, and let it speak to me. Not that many people are doing that. So we get to Dina, we get to the rape. They raped a daughter of Israel. To me, this is the same pattern as those people who say the law has been done away with. They want to take the Bible. They want to take Mashiach. They want to take what, how he lived and the way he lived, and they want to rape it. And they want to defile it and say that, that this is what the truth was. This is what Messiah wanted you to do. He wanted you to go break the law. He wanted to tell you God doesn't care what you eat. Okay? That's a defilement of what the Bible of Jesus and all of his followers said at the time, which was that you will eat kosher, that homosexuality is an abomination, that, you know, you will observe the Sabbath. I don't care if you like to eat a bacon burger and be gay all day long. It's only when you try and say that that's what God said was okay that I have to argue because logically and factually that's not what it says. So when they've got a lesbian uh, pastor at a church, I'm calling BS because it doesn't work that way. It's not about whether God loves some people or other people. It's about whether or not it says it's an abomination. So if you're talking about the Bible and whatever religion, you know, religious sect you're part of doesn't matter. What matters is what it says is one thing. And what you're doing or saying it says is another. But that can all be verified in the scripture. You can try and explain it away and say, well, that was for a previous time or that doesn't count anymore or blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter. But that's just not what the Bible said. Just like if a Christian says, hey, we have to keep the law. Well, well, uh, what's that? Oh, that's what the New Testament says. I said, no, that's not what the New Testament says. Let's open up the New Testament. And let's look over and over and over and over and over again. You can throw up your your small arguments about how you think it doesn't count. You don't need to use the Old Testament to even disprove that idea. You can just use the New Testament. And there's, there's way more weight on the side of it being obedience than there ever is disobedience where people twist a few verses and try and take them out of context. That's what they desire, so they want it to say that to them, and that's the part that they're there for. But they're there then because they desire not to keep the commandments of God. And yet they want the blessings of being a child of God. They want to be forgiven for their sins and given blessings when they're dead, yet they don't want to obey. They're just like Shechem, who wants to come over and rape Dina, which was a, a pure and holy thing of Israel, just as the Torah is a pure and holy thing of Israel, the commandments are, and the Bible. And they want to take out of it the blessings, and they want to reject the obedience. They wanted to rape and take away something from the Bible. And then just like in the story, then they want to, religion, just like the king, like his father, wants to say, then have, has the gall to come to, to Israel and say, can't we keep what we took? It's like taking the New Testament out of context trying to twist it and make it say that it really meant that that we weren't that we weren't supposed to keep God's commandments and obey him and then try and come back and say well 
isn't this just a new thing and like you Jews can have your old thing and this is still part of it but it's a new thing can we keep it I mean the pattern there is ridiculous how it lines up with this story and the fact is no you can't come and just take something from God the parts that you want and and satisfy your own desires and think then that you can keep it they wanted to keep Dina he raped her and then took her into his household and wanted to just keep her then permanently to me that's the same pattern as wanting to come to the Bible right and say well we believe that Jesus we believe that the Son of God really meant this when he was talking and we're going to twist some various things and we think that really what it's saying isn't that you should return to keeping the law but that you don't have to do anything and you're going to get all the rewards of it and we're just going to keep that and we're going to throw away and separate ourselves from that and we're just going to take this part over here with us because it gives us the fruit of our it feeds our desire that we can get rid of that the what's in it for me get rid of our guilt from our sin and yet have no responsibility and we're going to get all these blessings and everything and we want to keep it and he did keep it for a while. He kept Dina for a while. But then eventually, Le uh, Shimon and Levi came up and took her back and and uh, killed all, all the males there. The authority, the males represent the authority. All the authority over... The blessings of the Old Testament right when you get in the New Testament and you see about the 12 gates in the kingdom of heaven look there's 12 gates it says for the 12 tribes of Israel it doesn't have a Christian gate doesn't have a Gentile gate doesn't have any uh, 13th gate no such thing then there was replacement theology where okay we get rid of Israel and, and it's really now about us well then why are there 12 gates why didn't they go why isn't the future kingdom defined then as this is the one gate for Christians we were gonna the original blueprint had 12 gates we tore it down we rebuilt it one gate Christian gate Christians replaced Israel it doesn't line up that way it doesn't even work in the New Testament that way but that's essentially what they're wanting to do you don't have that blessing they say but we're under the new covenant well okay new covenant where would that come from what covenant the covenant of what God eventually you're gonna have to go back to the fact that Jesus had an Old Testament and all of his followers had an Old Testament. There was no New Testament for more than 100 years after his death. Okay? So nobody there was a New Testament Christian that are written of that those people think they're copying. If they wanted to really copy him, they'd pull out an Old Testament and base their faith on that. And then they'd be like Messiah, who also based his faith on obedience and righteousness through the Old Testament. Okay? And you'd also have to define what the new covenant was based off the Old Testament because all those people if they were talking about a new test a new covenant when their Bible was only the Old Testament then you have to use that as your context and say well where is that and was the Old Testament telling you you should be waiting for a New Testament and if so what would it look like they don't know because they don't know the book they don't know the book of the original Christians which was the Old Testament and they don't know the Messiah who lived by that book and was the most perfect example of that book of any man that ever walked. So that's where, that's where it doesn't line up. That's where we have to look at and say, wait a minute, how are you trying to pull some kind of, we're part of that, even though we have nothing to do of that. That's just like them taking this virgin of Israel, this pure woman of Israel, and taking her out of her nation and trying to pluck her out defile her and 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 put her in a new context that she didn't belong in okay Jesus had a context historically a religious context a prophetic context all that and his Bible and the prophecies about him and why they would have been looking for him and, and what he represented is all in the Old Testament that's the only Bible that existed at that time so if that's not how you build your foundation of your faith then you've simply plucked something out this idea of Jesus and plucked him out and put him in a different context in another nation like taking Dina out of Israel into another nation and raping her and thinking that you can keep her and that she's going to fulfill your desires and it ain't going to happen 
the truth is going to come out. The people who study, who are now getting to the point where they're starting to understand the whole scope of the scriptures without all of the Jewish tradition clouding their eyes or the Christian interpretations clouding their eyes. There's now people who are able to study the word of God from page one all the way through and, and also understand it in historical context along the way. And they're not going to be deceived by those rapings of the word of God and rapings of the Messiah and who he is and what he and and the interpretations of what he said and what what he represents and those people are going to bring the truth back and they're going to come back and get that pure thing the truth represented by Diener and take the truth back and those lies that hinged on a misunderstanding of of that somehow that Dina was theirs that they had this new truth that they had just stolen and 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 defiled and that somehow that that was going to be an enduring truth that lie and all those theological lies that have existed now for hundreds of years in Christianity are going to come to an end there'll come a time when the truth will will be taken back by the people and restored and the lies will be dead and they'll be revealed and and their own wickedness will re be returned back on them it's not about a theology it's about the truth and it's not about a person's interpretation I'm nothing a million other people can say the truth or a million people can 10 million can say a lie who and how many has no relevance to whether something's true or not the truth is the truth if it's one child saying it if it's if it's the most lowly person saying it and there's none else and if nobody's here if the trees wave in the wind and and that's all that's left it doesn't matter you can't destroy you can't utterly destroy the truth no matter what happens and it'll make its way out and it'll eventually like the light shine on all the darkness and destroy all the darkness and replace it this is about preparing for judgment this is you know Israel who God stays with them even in the half Torah even though they turn into wickedness and all of this he stays with them he's patient because he wants to develop them and in preparing for judgment we have to stay with the Torah we have to stay with the law and the commandments of God because they were righteous then they're righteous now and they will always be what is right to God and if you want to be prepared for judgment you need to as Yaakov did be afraid that was the beginning of his wisdom in this his fear of returning to his brother knowing he was this, he had sinned against him if you think hey we're the chosen people we're Jews so we got it good with God then you're not coming in fear like Yaakov did if you think hey we're the Christians we're saved so we're cool when Jesus returns then you're not coming in fear to the to the person who you wronged and if you're a messianic and you're somewhere in between those two and you don't have that fear you're wrong too the fact is you come in fear it starts with fear and then you better look and understand as he divided into his two bands you better understand the right division of the Word of God and you better understand what's weightier what's lesser and what's greater because you might have it wrong you might be thinking that some things are more valuable than others many people think salvation is more important than obedience I don't think so at all they put obedience up front in the camp saying well if we lose that you know technically even many messianics think oh well we don't you know we keep the commandments because we're saved but really they think salvation that's the one that's their Rachel that's the one that that they thinks more important even though the fruit of salvation just like the children of Israel came out of Mitzrayim out of Egypt all those guys were saved by the blood of the lamb they were literally saved first use of the word saved be still and see the salvation of the other line but yet they went on to not obey the law and they were wiped out and killed in the wilderness never seen the promised land 
So what was greater, getting into the promised land or coming out of Mitzrayim and being saved? Getting into the promised land, because getting into the promised land included salvation, but salvation alone did not include getting into the promised land. Obedience includes salvation because he saves the people who obey him. Whereas on the other hand, just because he saved you, you could still decide not to obey and never see the kingdom. So what was the purpose of being saved? There was no point. That's just like being a son and then disobeying your father. There's no point. You were literally born to obey your father and be like him, be a representation of him and his will. If you're not, then what was the point in calling yourself a seed of Abraham? What's the point in calling yourself a Christian if you disobey God? What's the point in being call, uh, call yourself a Jew if you disobey God? What's the point in being a Messianic if you disobey God? Salvation goes up front. If we have to lose one, we'll lose the salvation and still obey God. Because even if you're not going to be saved, you still want to obey God. That should still be the primary thing that's important to you, even unto death. That's how Messiah was. Even if he wasn't going to be saved, he was still going to obey unto death. Not my will, but thy will. So, as we look at all this, we see that preparing for judgment is about doing, understanding what was important. Having the gifts to present. Having the fruit. Humbling yourself and bowing down. And also praying to God, because after you do everything you can do right, Yaakov still prayed to God that he would be preserved and have mercy on him. That Esau would. And I think we have to do all those things, plus pray that God will have mercy on us when we meet him again. That's being prepared for judgment. Until next time on this issue.